other properties specific gravity is 2.7 and uh, melting point is 658 point 658 degrees celsius pure aluminum is very soft and ductile ok. So, that is again why it is not always preferred for structural applications what are the met aluminum alloying elements typically you put copper magnesium silicon manganese for increasing the strength and hardness and another way to increase enhance the properties is anodizing alum anodizing the aluminum which is used for cast fittings, grills, extruded sections for frame, drawers, window, doors, windows, partition walls. So, you can notice this all these are really non structural elements ok. They are not part of the major beams and columns in a uh, building ok. So, I will just show you uh, some uh, how this anodizing is being done ok. What is this? This is a process of coating of the aluminum with a thick layer of aluminum oxide ok. So, it how is it done by dipping the aluminum in a diluted or weak sulfuric acid bath what you see here this is the sulfuric acid bath ok H2SO4 bath mm -hmm. then you have this is aluminum ok and this is a cathode here and aluminum is the anode ok ok. So, a low direct current or low DC current is released releases the hydrogen at the cathode it releases the hydrogen at the cathode hydrogen is coming out and it releases the oxygen at the surface of the aluminum anode and which is the positive electrode. So, what happens eventually is the aluminum oxide is formed at the aluminum surface ok. Now, creating a built up of a transparent porous abrasion resistant corrosion resistant and non conductive aluminum oxide. So, there are so many properties for this aluminum oxide ok or this is what we call as anodized aluminum and to provide color like you see on the right side there is a key chain with the blue and red color that is achieved by using some dyes ok coloring dyes or pigments can be deposited on the fresh anodized surface I will show you how it is done ok. So, you can see here this is a yellow shaped uh, you know you can see here this one this element it is yellow color uh, that is because they used a dye which has yellow uh, color and this is the you can see here it is a zinc bath at the bottom of that uh, you can see here also there is a zinc bath into which this is uh, dipped. Uh, sorry not zinc bath I am sorry uh, it is a sulfuric acid bath into which it is dipped and then after that it is cleaned and all those processes uh, you know uh, so, uh, this is essentially the uh, cleaning process going on ok. Now, uh, how the anodized aluminum is made? Uh, or uh, how is it en enhanced that it is ensured that there is a good resistance uh, both in terms of hardness also and then also we need some kind of pockets for the dyes to occupy the space so that it gives color to it. So, what we do is first uh, the process is you take a silicon carbide uh, the uh, you know mold the reason is it you it has this indent I mean this protrusions on that ok. Now, when this is pressed against the aluminum plate, what will happen is there will be indentations formed on this ok. So, you are essentially making a uniform structure with uh, uh, indentations and then you grow the aluminum oxide on that surface. So, this, this is the aluminum oxide which is grown ok by applying current to it this, this is that oxide layer ok the white thing. Mm. So, you have this oxide layer formed now uh, then uh, you have uh, the how the mixing process or the movement of the uh, you know uh, the dipping elements or the anodes in the solution or the uh, fluid the flow of the solution around this thing and the temperature of the solution play a key role in forming this uh, oxide layers. So, eventually what you get it you can look at this this is the oxide layer or the uh, u shaped layer which is formed it is a microscopic scale 
okay and then inside that you have metal deposits or which is basically giving you the uh, the color also okay and then um, in a rather 3d scale you know view you, it will look something like this so you have this u shaped pocket so honeycomb structure you know similar very similar to a honeycomb cell structure uh, with a hollow core called a pore and in that pore you will uh, you know fill the uh, coloring uh, dye pig uh, coloring pigments etc uh, but now uh, the relationship between the cell wall size and the properties so the cell wall size and the pore size can be controlled mainly by changing by temperature and mixing of the uh, solution or agitation now while large cells with small pores large cells with small pores are stronger and protect the surface better but do not take the dye as well in other words large uh, cells so let us say I am going going with a cell like this okay and let me so let us say I have a pore like this okay oops this is one case assume okay and another case is small pore but large pore volume okay so these are the two cases we are talking large cells with small pores that is this case here are stronger and protect the surface better okay but they don't they don't take the dye as well means the, there is no you know, space for the dye to be occupied whereas the large pores with thinner cell walls so this is the thinner cell wall that means the pore size is larger and they will take the dye better but do not protect the aluminum as well from the physical abuse so you will have a lot of damage or abrasion uh, those kind of problems could be uh, there so essentially when you talk about longevity etc it is a balancing act you have to kind of adjust the size of the pore size and size of the cell wall thickness etc have to be adjusted so that you get optimized properties now on the bottom right what you see is a micrograph of surface anodized the surface showing ideally like you know ordered pores on the left half you can see here on the left half of the drawing you have an ordered structure whereas on the right half you have a random distribution okay so these are all manufacturing uh, you know procedures of or the anodizing procedures now what is the advantage of doing this anodized uh, anodizing you can see that anodized uh, aluminum is the one with the red curve here and that another typical aluminum with the 1100 so the range the properties how it can change and mild steel is somewhere here and hardened steel here so the hardness so this this property is where uh, essentially looking at the wear cycles so basically it is looking at abrasion resistance or hardness you know how resistive not hardness necessarily how resistive the material is against abrasion so it is looking at wearing cycle so as a function of wearing cycle what is the uh, thickness so if you look at the horizontal axis let us say I am going to look at here let us say 0 0.005 let us say take this point okay at a thickness of 0 0.005 that much material it takes how many wearing cycles for that to lose okay so in case of an aluminum almost nothing this is where the aluminum it, you know it's it's right here and then in case of a mild steel maybe this is here in the in case of uh, hardened mild steel you can see it is somewhere here and in case of hard anodized aluminum it is somewhere here so that's the huge difference you can see how many extra or additional like that's about 60 cycles were required to uh, you know uh, to remove that the thickness loss which is looking at okay so definitely uh, when you anodize use the anodized aluminum you have a very excellent surface property hmm? so the aluminum with anodization uh, or anodized aluminum will have very good wear resistant or rather abrasion resistant i mean it can be related to that also if if not directly 
uh, and that means hardness is also very good. Okay. Now, let us look at difference between this is electroplating you might have heard about this in your earlier schooling. right? So, let us see the difference between electroplating and anodizing. What is electroplating? Electroplating is essentially coating of a different metal to the surface. Okay. So, if this is the on the top right you can see if this is the metal which you want to coat we are co in this particular example copper is coated on to the metal which need to be protected. Okay. So, any metal M E can be coated with copper that is the way by which when we when we talk about electroplating that means that. In case of anodizing what it means is coating of the same oxide okay, coating of metals with tightly adhering oxide of the same metal that is the difference. Okay. So, in the case of electroplating one metal is coated on to the another metal in case of anodizing a metal oxide is coated to that same metal. Okay. So, this is the main difference and when you do this metal oxide being coating oxide coating then you get change the corrosion properties because it is electrical resistivity etcetera changes and then you also change uh, you know that depends on the property of the oxide layer, but essentially you get a hard surface etcetera hard and corrosion resistant surface. Now, where do we use aluminum? Okay. Aluminum foil can be used to insulate building even though not much used in our country, but if you go abroad you will see that this is widely used in many of the building construction. Okay. Mainly because it has this reflex you know it, it reflects the heat uh, from the uh, heat energy uh, radiant energy and up to 97 percent of the radiant energy can be reflected back if you use uh, aluminum foil. Okay. What does it composed of? You can see as you see in this picture here two outer layers of aluminum foil and an inner layer of some inert material. So, it is like a sandwich material a sandwich product and typically this inner layer is made of some kind of plastic polyethylene plastic fiberglass etcetera. To create the main purpose is to create an insulating air layer in between. So, you have an aluminum layer some air layer with some bubbles etcetera uh, the, the, the purpose of this fiberglass or polythene is to create that space in between the two aluminum uh, layers. Okay. So, that will provide a lot of uh, uh, resistance against the uh, heat uh, you know across that layer. Now, here is an example to show you can see here um, on the left side. Uh, let you can you see this box here there is a box like structure here and here also you can see a box okay and inside the so this temperature uh, is a fiberglass is ineffective at stopping radiant heat but the reflective foil redirects the intense rays from the heat lamp keeps the chamber cool at 78 degrees celsius so on the left side you can see that it has aluminum foil and then there is a bulb on top outside and then they are measuring the temperature inside the box. Okay. So, in the left case where it is covered with aluminum foil that, that even though the high heat from the bulb it is not able to penetrate into the box. Whereas, on the right side you can see 107 degree Celsius okay, on the right side. So, very clearly uh, you know aluminum foil can uh, prevent the entry of heat. So, on the right side you can see a picture on the this picture on the bottom right it is a part of a structural uh, structure or a building where you can see a column and uh, you know uh, a beam structure there and the wall element. So, the wall element is is actually coat they are providing an aluminum foil on the wall element. So, that the more the uh, heat does not enter into the building through that wall element. Now, aluminum is also used for form work because it is lightweight, it is easy for people to carry uh, the workers to carry etcetera. So, widely used for concrete construction uh, also. So, aluminum form works are 
uh, nowadays used for getting nice fi nicely finished exposed concrete surfaces okay now let's look at the next metal that is copper copper production worldwide if you look at india is not a major producer okay the top producer is chile okay then china then peru so chile is about 32 percentage thai china uh, you know all others included is like a 14 so the next player is china which is about 9 percentage okay peru 8 percentage so more or less very uh, not big difference but chile really you know uh, outperform everyone else uh, probably because of the raw material availability in that country okay okay now uh, for making copper mainly the oxide and sulfide ores these are the uh, main ores which are used for the uh, production of copper and these ores typically contain about 0.5 to 2 percentage of uh, copper so just very little no 0.5 to 2 percentage of copper so you have a lot of material to be processed and lot of waste will be generated and then so and what are the typical ores this is chalcosite and chalcopyrite and then covalite so these are the typical ores which are uh, away or which are being used and about 80 percent of the global uh, copper production is from the sulfide source so this is the main uh, copper ore which is used what the picture i showed on the right side is from you know typically like in the case of uh, steel production uh, or iron you have billets so like that in the case of copper they typically they produce this kind of rods large diameter rods and which is used for uh, further uh, production of wires etc okay that is probably why that shape is still maintained at circle I do not know but I am guessing it uh, that way okay now copper and its alloys because of high resistance against corrosion atmospheric corrosion high resistance against atmospheric corrosion. Uh, copper is used in buildings along the coastal regions and also wherever there is a corrosivity is high copper is actually used. Now traditionally used in temples, roof elements of temples and then also ships uh, sheathing for the hull. So this protects the uh, hull from uh, you know getting into direct contact with the sea water uh, etc. So on the left side you can see a temple roof. Uh, in Kerala because uh, in Kerala you have lot many temples are like this uh, which has this copper cladded uh, roofs okay and then this is another uh, close up of this uh, you know how it will look like. So mainly uh, wherever you have a highly corrosive environment uh, copper is a good product to good metal to use. Now, uh, this is a couple of examples where the uh, corrosion product of the copper is used for the aesthetic appearance. You can see here this is a embassy building Nor Nordic embassy in Berlin, Germany where uh, these are all copper clad uh, you know uh, the walls, sun shades etc are all uh, cladded with copper sheets and the green color which you see is actually the corrosion product of the copper okay the patina or the oxide layer of copper, uh, bronze, etc. I mean all these have this green color right and statue of liberty you know this one the uh, color is not really the paint it is the oxide of the copper and then let it be there this is a natural color it will not fade away etc. So there are, and you have to just see the beauty of that you know and but this one here it is not really uh, good for because it is a pipes when they start corroding. But I am just trying to show you that if you have copper pipes you, you might see this green color uh, rust uh, on top of that okay. Now what are the alloys uh, there are two major alloys one is brass and the other one is bronze okay. So this copper is used in electrical cables plumbing you can see the photograph showing different applications of copper and the alloys are. Uh, one brass which is an alloy of copper and zinc the bronze is the alloy of copper and tin okay zn and this is sn okay now 
uh, these are generally like a stronger than copper that is why they go for this alloying process and can be cast into different molds or whatever shape you want and brass fittings are ex used extensively for doors or window fittings. I mean it also has this golden color so people like it aesthetic purpose with the teak wood or in a wooden it matches nicely and then you know it is a really shiny uh, also. So, you can see this difference between brass and bonds very difficult sometimes to really uh, notice the difference, but uh, just to uh, give you a sample uh, to look at. Mm. Now, advantages and disadvantages of copper pipe or plumbing, uh, let us look at advantages first, okay. relatively soft metal. So, it is easy to bend and cut, let us say you are talking about a plumbing work, if you have very rigid and which you cannot bend or slight adjustment etc are not possible then the workers may not like to work with it or the workability I mean if you want to relate to cement concrete etc but it is it's easier to bend cut cut to a particular size and shape whatever you want to do it is easy to work with. So, workers will prefer to use this kind of pipe rather than a steel pipe hmm, which is very difficult to cut and work with. Now, bacterial growth is less than that in the plastic pipes. If you have PVC pipes or other um, you know plastic pipes, then you will see that after some time there are slimy layer formation etcetera on inside the pipe and which is less in case of uh, copper pipes. And also it is very resistant to corrosion. So, that means durability is very uh, good and it is UV resistance whereas, if you look at the PVC or you know PVC pipes or other plastic pipes uh, they, they might be might not be UV resistant or not UV means ultraviolet and after some times those plastics will become brittle, but whereas in case of copper you do not have to worry about such problems. Mm. Okay. Now, then less temperature induced variation, if even if there is a fire attack or something, if you have plastic pipes etcetera, they will melt and then get damaged, but copper pipes will stay intact for relatively higher uh, temperature. Now, no release of toxic gases, if there is a fire etcetera, if you have PVC pipes etcetera, it will it all that will burn and that means a lot of toxic gas will come out, will be released. But in case of copper pipe again you do not have to worry about such toxic gases and copper being a metal is easy to recycle and reuse for making the same thing. But if you have plastics and especially if you have a thermoset plastics then you cannot really uh, reuse uh, those, those kind of plastics. So, that also adds value to the sustainability option you know uh, so you can actually recycle the copper pipes. Now, one disadvantage of copper pipe is associated with the pH. See, in most of our cities, sometimes the pH value of the water which you get, I have seen places where pH value of the water is less than 6.5, okay. So, uh, or you know, so you have to see if that is a condition, copper pipe may not be a good uh, option to go for. Uh, so, you have to see what is the type of solution or water which is going through the copper pipe or where it is being placed whether the pH environment uh, to which the copper pipe is exposed should be in between this range then only it is good otherwise it will not uh, be good uh, it will be harmful. Okay. And other major problem is it is uh, you know because it is very expensive people tend to steal it away or vandalism is a big problem, but that is a non technical problem we have to work around the system to. Uh, counter that. Okay. So, to summarize today's lecture, we talked about production properties and uses of aluminum uh, and uh, also production properties and uses of uh, copper in especially in the civil engineering uh, or construction sector. Thank you.